On a couple of recent trips, I decided to try my own hand at shooting film. Yes, the nostalgia was strong, and my desire to actually get an old film camera, or two, and take travel pictures with them. But I was also curious to go back in time so to speak, to an analog world to see how far we've come in the digital world. But because there are so many variables involved in shooting film, I had to make sure I had a backup for capturing the memories. There was some deliberation, but I think the choice was fairly obvious. In one hand would be the film camera, and in the other hand would be the Pixel 6 Pro. Hey, it's Joshua Vergara. What's going on, everybody? It's a Pixel versus film, and the experience that reminded me why this phone is still one of my go-tos. From what I hope are obvious reasons, I'm not actually comparing the image quality of film cameras from like the 60s and 70s to the computational photography of the Pixel. And in the context of having a smartphone as a backup to the analog picture taking, I think it's pretty safe to say that pretty much any smartphone would serve that particular purpose well. If anything, I just wanted to take this opportunity to revisit the Pixel 6 Pro, and then I would share what film cameras I got, give some thoughts on them, and how the Pixel supported my photography journeys during that recent trip. Speaking of travel, it can be more of a lifestyle than just an activity, and Casetify, the sponsor of this video, definitely understands that with some of their recent case releases. Now, protection against drops is one thing, but these cases are also safe against germs because each case is antimicrobial via the Defensify material. And finally, they're safer for the environment too because each case is made of 65% recycled materials. All of that leading to some awesome looking cases that I've had on my personal Pixel 6 Pro since getting them. Now, their recent releases for various Android phones, including the Pixel 6 Pro, uh, includes a partnership with Pangram Pangram, sporting multiple great designs on the company's impact cases. You can find links to all of the cases that I'm featuring in this video in the description below, and each of these were handpicked by me for various reasons. The retro gaming machine design is a throwback to times that I have gone to Japan, a place that I would love to return to and to further capture using another pixel in my pocket. The PP0008 design sports the kinds of labels and stickers that you might see on a package going overseas, and it is the case that I actually used on my recent trip to Manila. And finally, the Pangram Custom is probably my favorite because it helps me rep my home of Los Angeles in this boarding pass design, complete with a custom inscription of my handle JVTechT. This particular design can have different cities from and around the world on it too, so you are likely to find one that suits you as well. With each case rigorously drop tested to ensure quality materials and proper protection, there's no need to sacrifice style. You can browse Casetify's extensive catalog of cases, including the impact cases that I talked about in the link in the description below. Show your colors with Casetify's offerings, and I want to give a big thanks to Casetify for sponsoring this video. Now, as a flagship smartphone sporting multiple sensors and multiple lenses, the Pixel 6 Pro obviously has way more capabilities. You have an ultra-wide, a wide, a telephoto lens, and of course, video recording. There's so many tools here that the film camera obviously just won't match it. However, when I present the comparison shots from the film cameras to the Pixel, uh, one thing I want to note is that the Pixel is always shooting at 2x. That's a realization I had regarding various focal lengths that the wide angle is already pretty dang wide on its own. Since the lenses on my film cameras are around 35mm, which is my personal favorite focal length, recreating that on pretty much any smartphone I realized is around uh, 2x, a little bit of a punch in. And that's one lesson that was learned pretty early in this little experiment of mine. But here's a look at one of the analog shooters. This is the Olympus Trip 35. Released in, I think, the mid-1960s, it's an iconic point-and-shoot camera that has some of the most attractive retro stylings. You can't deny that it's a really nice-looking camera, with its retro aesthetic and this custom brown leather wrap. Now, this camera was meant to be super simple. It can't even shoot at shutter speeds other than 1 200th or 1 40th of a second, depending on what the light meter perceives. And if you do try to shoot a dark scene, there's this red flag that will come up that is basically telling you, no, this won't work. You're supposed to leave the aperture dial back here on A for automatic, because the aperture values here are only really useful when using a flash. And then you move this focus dial here uh, to the kind of subject that you roughly want to capture, and finally, judge the distance yourself so you can get that focus right. Yeah, this is called zone focusing, and basically it means that you have to change the manual focus using this dial, and then you have to judge that you are actually the right distance away. These guides here for various types of subjects, they're descriptive enough, but in the heat of the moment I was definitely hurting for like any kind of autofocus, but once you get the hang of that you can just enjoy the shutter sound as you snap away.
And this is actually a solar-powered selenium cell. It's the light meter, but also it is a solar-powered, basically, battery of sorts, which means that you never actually had to replace batteries in this almost completely mechanical camera. So anyone that took care of their Trip 35s well enough could still use them effectively now. This is what ease of use actually looked like, and Olympus was so confident in the Trip 35 that they made and sold millions of them. That's why it's not so hard to find these in fairly good condition. Of course, by today's standards, easy is fiercely relative. You won't know that you got the focus right until way later when the film is developed and scanned, uh, and it's not like you can quickly go back to that scenario and then take the shot again. That's the whole reason why I had to make sure the Pixel 6 Pro was in my pocket. But there's a certain vibe that the film brings to the memories that is kind of hard to replicate. By the way, for all of the film cameras that I am using here, I am using Fujifilm ISO 200 film, which of course will give its own little look to the different photos. But sure, you can use filters and use different camera apps to recreate the film grain or the vintage colors, but the disposable nature of digital just can't compare to the exhilaration you feel when you finally get the actual film scan. Sure, you can see here that some of the pictures just didn't turn out well, but that doesn't mean I don't appreciate them all the same. Meanwhile, we're using our phones to just smash the shutter button a dozen times at any given moment, and nearly all of those dozen shots can get discarded or just take up room in our cloud storage. In all honesty, I can actually see why people rediscover film these days and become obsessed with it. When you have just 36 shots in your film roll, you think much harder about what you want or even can capture, adding to intentionality. Yes, I'm using that word, and thus further locking the memory in your brain. So in using the Pixel 6 Pro while on this trip, I was also reminded of the reasons why I continuously gravitate to it. There might have been some growing pains with Google's latest flagship smartphone, but over time those kinks have either been ironed out or at least minimized. You see, I was navigating around the greater Seattle area a lot, and asking Google Assistant a lot of questions came via my favorite method, holding down the power button and talking to it walkie-talkie style. And because the Tensor chip in here has proven to be a high-performing processor, it never really lagged or slowed me down at all. That same chip makes it easier than ever to accurately do voice to text, which has become pretty invaluable, period. I cannot bring myself to type long messages or emails on a smartphone anymore, comma, when I just hit the button on Gboard, comma, say what I want, comma, and just do a little bit of proofreading before I send. And of course, you do have to talk a little bit robotically and actually dictate your punctuation, but still, it's really comfortable. It's the little things that help add to the experience or at least set it apart from other products. So, enter my other film camera, the one that I actually do carry with me everywhere now, the Olympus XA. This camera is arguably even more iconic than the Trip 35. The XA was made in the 70s and added a few extra tools to that point-and-shoot camera formula. One huge change is the rangefinder. Now, there's this lever on the bottom that will change the focus while moving a very subtle patch in the middle of the viewfinder. What you do is you can judge the distance first from your subject, and then you use the patch to confirm the focus by lining it up with the actual scene. Honestly, rangefinders are about as hard to explain as they are to master. Aperture selection is more encouraged on the XA compared to the Trip 35, making it a bit better for lower light shooting. Not to mention, this camera can actually shoot at a much wider range of shutter speeds. Other tools included a self-timer and exposure compensation, a toggle that was mainly used for situations where subjects might be backlit. So even though there are extra tools, which makes things a little bit more complicated, this was still considered super easy in the world of film cameras. The Olympus XA is also certainly one of the most pocketable cameras, while still managing to have a design that would cover and protect that 35mm lens. There was one thing you had to watch out for, and that's this shutter button. Uh, it's super sensitive, so even grazing it with a finger would make it go off, like this. It does make the camera a little bit better for quick capture, but sometimes you just find yourself wasting shots. I felt more confident having the XA in more situations because it was simply more capable. In lower light situations, it wouldn't be amazing, even at the most wide open aperture of f2.8, but still, it was an improvement from the Trip 35. That being said, there's obviously no beating the Pixel 6 Pro's abilities in low light. That computational processing joins things like longer shutter speeds, and it can create something out of basically nothing in any given scene. That's one of the conveniences that we have now in smartphone photography. High dynamic range, software ingenuity. Even if cameras like the Olympus XA felt ahead of their time in terms of convenience, well, the future is now with the Pixel. I was able to get in-focus shots more often with the XA due to that rangefinder system, but that wouldn't stop me from still confirming having those same shots with my phone no matter what. It's not as if the Pixel 6 Pro is perfect though. 
As the phone that I used on the daily during the trip and as my backup camera, um, I was burning through the battery um, kind of quickly on many occasions. Now, the coin battery inside of the Olympus XA and the virtually batteryless design of the Trip 35 mean that the only thing stopping the shoot in those cameras is the 36 shot film limit. But on the Pixel 6 Pro, well, it might conk out early under the high demands of a traveling user like myself. Now, these are grievances that you probably have heard from my peers, and after seeing their perspectives on the Pixel 6 Pro now, I thought this might be a fun way for me to revisit the phone. Because this video was never meant to be an actual comparison of a Pixel versus film. Instead, it's a look at what we have right now as an easy yet powerful camera system compared to what might have been the equivalent back then. The style and the shooting experience of a film camera is really hard to deny. But those are really novelties to someone like me and many of you out there who might already have a great way to capture memories so well, in this case, thanks to Google's current flagship. And on the Pixel side, features like the Magic Eraser were actually really handy. They cleaned up pictures and scenes in a way that is basically impossible to do on a negative or a print. Of course, the software will make up for any foolish attempts to capture a less than ideal scene, which is something that you can't really think of doing on film. And if you make mistakes on a film camera, well, they can be rather catastrophic to the collection of memories. Like recently when I found out that my Trip 35 actually didn't have any film in it uh, when I thought I was shooting a bunch during my recent trip to the Philippines. That was a huge bummer, and you can see it in my face. Well, really, in my reaction here. All of those memories are gone from the analog method, but thankfully most of those shots were salvaged because I made sure to shoot it again with the digital method. And the virtues of this camera system, with the Google software for example, will soon be coming to an even more affordable smartphone. Which is huge, because the Pixel 6a is further making this reliability, the kind that made me choose it during this film experiment, uh, more available to everyone. So look forward to my thoughts on the Pixel 6a when I finally get my hands on it by subscribing to my channel. If you want to see more videos on classic film cameras like this, maybe like a chill photo walk or two in a nice place, well, let me know in the comments. And if you enjoyed this soft, offbeat return to the Pixel 6 Pro, you can hit that like button. And finally, a big thanks again to Casetify for sponsoring this video and for providing me with some pretty dope cases. With all that said, I'm going to go ahead and call it on this one. Thank you so much for hanging out with me today. Please take care of yourselves and each other, and enjoy your tea, everybody.